to going to. Thank the Lord for that promise. And thank the Lord that his promises are yea in Christ Jesus. They're, they're sure. They're fixed. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. Have he not has he said and shall he not do it? Men, I mean, that's if you didn't have that hope, I I don't see how folks I guess they just delude themselves. I don't see how folks could make it down here without uh, hope like that. But anyway, uh, so much for the good stuff. Now I uh, need to preach to you a little bit. <laughs> uh, James chapter four. Uh, we'll uh, look at some stuff here. I know this is written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad, but we can get some instruction and in righteousness from it and the truth in it that will apply to the uh, body of Christ. James chapter 4, verse number 13, he says, Go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For they ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth not, to him it is sin. I'm about to preach a message there, the title from verse number 14. For what is your life? For what is your life? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we're uh, thankful for this opportunity to be here today and to open up your word with like-minded believers. We're thankful, Lord, for your many blessings. And I pray that you would uh, guide and direct us in the truth now. And pray that um, those that hear this on the um, the internet, YouTube, or wherever, if there's somebody, Lord, that's not saved, that they trust the Lord Jesus Christ before it's too late. May I these things in Jesus' name. Amen. What is your life? You ever thought about that? You get to the end of your life. What was your life? Well, our life will be reviewed one day, like a diary. We were talking yesterday, uh, Patty and I, about some stuff that happened several years ago, and was trying to decide uh, how the how it went, how many times it was. And I said, I don't know for sure. I had to go back and check my diary, a journal. I call it a journal. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, your life could be a diary. Some of us have better memories than others. Some of us don't have as good a memory. But there's a there's a, a record of events of your life on this earth. That uh, when, you, when you die, they'll probably put you up a tombstone. It'll have your birth date. And then your, the day you depart, and there'll be a dash in between those two. That dash represents your life. And the long and the short of it, that's it. Um, life is a, is a diary. It's, it's days. It's uh, one day at a time. That's all you can. That's all you can live. Uh, he said that there's a group of folks here that say we're going to uh, tomorrow. We're going to such a city and we're going to continue their year. Well, that's the plans, but you may not. You don't know what a day may bring forth. I can tell you what I'm planning on doing tomorrow, but that's subject to change at a moment's notice. It'll just take one phone call. One email, one text, one knock on the door, and it can completely change. You don't know what what uh, tomorrow is. You don't know what the day may bring forth. Um, a diary, a day, your life's a duty. Um, Robert E. Lee said, there is an honor in duty done. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said, when you've done all those things, which you should do, say, it, uh, we're unprofitable servants. We've done that which is our duty to do. What is your life? What is your life? Well, he said life's a vapor. It appears for a little time and then vanisheth away. Um, Job said that in Job 7, verse 6, my, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. We were in Scotland several years ago, and there's a, a fellow there that has an old-timey, shuttle one of the few that's still left in the world i guess and he was making uh, wool into uh, blankets um scarves things like that whatever you make use wool 
uh, to do. And he, he had a system where they was doing it by hand, and that shuttle would move back and forth. And, man, it was going quick. He was teaching his grandson how to do it. His grandson wasn't quite as adept as it as he was, but that thing just moving back and forth. And I thought about that verse. It's swifter than a weaver's shuttle, and it's spent without hope. He said in verse, uh, or chapter 7, verse 7, Oh, remember that my life is a wind. Right breath is blowing through and then gone or wind blowing through. He said in Job 8, 9, We are but of yesterday and know nothing because our days upon earth are a shadow. They're swifter than a post. Uh, and they're past like a, a swift ship or an eagle hastening to its prey. In Job 14, 1 and 2, he said, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Life is a vapor. All right. Uh, what is your life? I'd like, first of all, I talk about the language of life. The language of life. In verses 11 and 12, he said, There's uh, one lawgiver who's able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judges another? Go to now and say, uh, Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow. We will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. They're saying something. A lot of your life is spent talking. A lot of your life is spent verbally in what you say. Uh, there is somewhere a heart that is broken today, a soul that is crushed a long life's way, a soul that is um, a long life's way. What What is the cause of that, you say? It's gossip. Someone has spoken an unkind word, perhaps repeated something they've heard until some life is deeply disturbed by gossip. Have you stopped to ask, is it true? Is it kind until the source of the rumor you find? If you have, I'm sure you will leave behind all gossip. Amen. Man, we like to hear stuff. We like to broadcast stuff. We like to say stuff. TV, radio, newspapers, magazines, all that kind of stuff. It just glorified gossip, basically. Amen. Amen. That's uh, that's what they're doing, just gossiping about stuff. They even they even have I don't know if it's still if they still do it, but they used to have what they call a gossip column. Why? Why would you subject yourself to that? Why would you want to do something like that? Yes. Sucked into those traps. Will Rogers, uh, I guess he was kind of a comedian back in the day, back in the 1920s. He said, the only time people dislike gossip is when you gossip about them. <laughs> Every other time they like it. Most of us do. John Wesley had a group of Methodists sign a covenant. That's six, six articles in it. John Wesley was a Methodist. He was a... Uh, a great preacher back in bygone years. These six articles, he had these uh, Methodist followers sign it. The first article, that uh, an agreement, that the, if they agreed with it, that we will not listen or willingly acquire after ill concerning another. We will not listen or willingly inquire after ill concerning another. Would you sign that? Somebody going to speak ill about somebody? You're going to listen to it? Number two, that if we do hear any ill of each other, we will not be forward to believe it. If you do hear ill about somebody, your first reaction should be, that can't be true. Certainly not repeat it. Number three, that as soon as possible, we will communicate what we hear by speaking or writing to the person concerned. Woo! I heard such and such about you. Is that true? Instead of going to somebody else, like, I heard such and such about so and so. Did you hear that? Number four, that until we have done this, we will not write or speak a syllable of it to any other person. If you've joined his group back in the day, the Methodist group, you had to sign this compact. Well, the Methodists come a long way, haven't they? Number five, that neither neither will we 
mention it after we have done this to any other person. I got a prayer request. <laughs> Number six, that we will not make any exception to any of these rules unless we think ourselves absolutely obliged in conference. In other words, after you've checked it out with everybody else and gone over it, you're not going to break this uh, break this uh, covenant here, this agreement. That's your mouth, man. Amen. Amen. Um, Charles Spurgeon said, I, uh, I never like people to tell me secrets, for I cannot keep them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell him anything, amen. <laughs> Solomon said in Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. The Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, for, for by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Hmm. We're going to bring up them words. And you stop and think about that. You're uh, you are justified by your words. Um, for whosoever called for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You you probably prayed and and uh, asked the Lord to save you. In a sense, those words justified you. I know it was His shed blood on the cross of Calvary, but it was imputed to your account when you asked God to save you, trusted Him to save you. And people get the white throne judgment, those lost people there. Their words will condemn them. I never got to hear. Well, that's interesting because somebody tried to give you a gospel tract and turned it down. By thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Uh, watch your mouth. The language of our life. Um, you, I, you could preach on that all day long, man. That tongue. There's... Uh, I haven't counted it or gone verse by verse, but through the Bible, especially in the book of Proverbs, there's so much material on your your mouth, your tongue, your lips, your words. It would behoove us to uh, be careful about what we uh, what we say and how we say it and who we say it to. Amen. Amen. Watch that gossip. I heard a preacher say one time that some people's tongues are so long they can sit in the living room and lick a, lick a skillet clean all the way in the kitchen. <laughs> now, that's just a hyperbole, but you get the idea. Amen. Keep your mouth shut. Uh, the Bible says over there in Proverbs 10, 19, uh, something really good and just left my mind. Uh, in a multitude of words, there one hath not sinned. In a multitude of words, you keep talking, you're going to end up sinning. I think it was Wesley, John Wesley, the one I read about there that 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 agreement they made that uh, he he uh, believe he was in, I'm, not, I'm not mistaken. He wouldn't carry on a conversation over 15, 15 or twenty minutes with somebody. He said after that, it's going to get in, it's going to decline into sin. You couldn't you couldn't talk with somebody longer than that without talking about somebody or something or complaining or something like that, uh, turning into sin. In the multitude of words, there one of not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. The language of life. All right, I'd like to talk about the length of our life. The length of our life. Uh, in verse number fourteen, he said, "For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away." The length of your life. Life is short. Amen. Sin. Uh, death is sure. Sin the cause. Christ the cure. But life is short. You can live. We're, we're, we're told that, you know, three score and ten, 70 years. And if they, if it be four score, it's uh, full of labor. Uh, they say after 70, it's borrowed time. Well, really, any day is borrowed time. There, there's folks that have died in infancy. Children have died. Young people have died. There's no, there's no promise of tomorrow. Life is short. And even if you live to be 100 and 
20. What is that compared to eternity? In Psalm 90, verse 9, the Bible says, For all for all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. It's a tale that is told. That's, that's something that just like a, just takes a few minutes to, to tell it. Tell a tale. And it don't take long. That's what your life is likened to. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, somebody's done the calculation, the average lifespan of, of a man, a male. And yes, there is a difference between male and female. The average lifespan of a man is 72.06 years. For a woman, it's 77.01 years. And that's just average. Um, what, what is that? Not much. Not much. The length of our lives, it's, uh, it's short. It's short and it's moving fast. I kid, but I'm only about halfway kidding when I say sometimes about what happened to the 90s, the 1990s, 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? They was just like, Whoo! and we're already in 2023, a couple of months, 2024. When I was a child, I laughed and wept. Time crept. When I was a youth, I dreamed and talked. Time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. Then, as with the years I older grew, time flew. Then I shall find, as I travel on, time gone. Or soon I shall find, as, as I travel on, time gone. And I used to hear old people talking about, man, time just flying. Time just flying. Where did, where did time go? Yeah, whatever. I'm thinking time as slow as Christmas. You know, when you're a kid, when's Christmas gone out? Will it ever get? Uh, school years are slow. Summer would go fast, but these old folks talking about time flying, time flying. I didn't understand. I do now. I do now. Man, this uh, it goes quick. And, and that's your life. It goes quick. Um, uh, Job 9.25, he said, now my days are swifter. Uh, then a post, uh, they they flee away, uh, and there's no good. He, that post is like a like a postman uh, delivering mail. And back in the day, they would do it on horseback. Uh, they would go by like the kind of like the Pony Express, go by quick. He said his life's like that. It, it, it's swift. It's short. It's very short. Swifter than a weaver's shuttle and spent without hope. Life is significant. What is your life? Well, it's it's significant in that the Lord gave you life. God created you, formed you in the womb. You're an individual that God himself designed and made. Your, your individual life that God gave you is significant. Uh, so much so that that uh, the the punishment for uh, for the crime of murder is capital punishment, life for life. You snuff out somebody's life, God said your life is going to be snuffed out. He he warned about that before the law. He warned about that during the law, and he warned about that after the law. That's a uh, pan dispensational, if you would. Life for life. Paul said, "If I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die." Capital punishment. Why is that? Because that, that shows you the significance, the preciousness of the life that God gave you. It's important, significant. You ought to do something with it for God. Use your life uh, for the glory of God. We talked about that in Sunday school. So how can I do that? Well, reach people with the gospel. That'd be a good thing to do. Get it out any way you can that's legitimate. Um, get some folks saved. You uh, just uh, when when the Lord gave that parable about the, the sower went forth to sow the seed, he scattered that stuff out. It was it was incumbent upon the receivers what they did with it, not the sower. We need to get the the seed out. We need to sow it. 
and hopefully somebody gets saved. But your your life could be spent uh, re- uh, reaching people with the gospel, proclaiming the word of God. Isaiah fifty five eleven. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth; it shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall uh, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. That'd be a good thing to do with your life. That'd be, uh, show the significance of it. Um, uh, Moses wrote over there, he wrote the Psalm, Psalm 90. He said, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Life's too short to be foolish with it. The life that God gave you is so significant, we ought to apply it to wisdom. Apply our hearts to wisdom. Um, the the length of your life, the language of your life. Thirdly, I like to say this: the Lord of your life. Notice there in verse fifteen, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord will, that's um, uh, you ought to you ought to check with the Lord and see what He wants you to do, and uh, live according to His will. So I don't know what the will of God is. Well, I'm going to tell you. Three things that help you determine the will of God. If you don't get this first one right, the next two don't matter. But the first one is, find out in the Bible what God's will for your life is. Um, God won't ever tell you to do something with a warm, fuzzy feeling or a dream or uh, anything like that that's going to contradict his word. So if you come and tell me that God told you to do something, and I know it's against his word. I know for sure that God did not tell you to do that. Okay? I just want that to to be well understood. He's not going to tell you to do something against his will that's in his word. So what is his will? Well, it's his will for you to be saved. Uh, God's not willing that any should perish. uh, 1 Timothy Two, four, but that all would come to repentance. Um, God is not slack concerning his promise that some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward and is not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. It's God's will for everybody to be saved. And so, well, everybody ain't saved exactly if they're unsaved against the will of God. God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. It's not God's will for anybody to go to hell. He didn't want anybody to perish. So first of all, it's God's will for you to be saved. And so I got my own religion. I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about you being saved. Trust in Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. <clears throat> Salvation's a person, not a religion. It's God's will for you to be sanctified over there in First Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. You don't even have to pray about that. God wants you to live a clean life, a pure life, a sanctified life. life. Amen? It's God's will for you to be a living sacrifice. Paul said over there in Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It's not your will, but his that needs to be done in your life. It's God's will for you to be a living sacrifice. It's God's will you to be submissive to uh, to your leaders, to those that are over you. In uh, 1 Peter chapter uh, 2 verse uh, 12, he said um, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles that whereas they speak against you as evil doers, they may by your good works, which, he, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. <clears throat> Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. <clears throat> There's some things I wish wasn't in the Bible. <laughs> I'm not going to take it out. It should be there. It's the truth. But man, that goes against the grain. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers 
for the praise of them that do what and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. See, I, I think uh, maybe you ain't got a problem with knowing what the will of God is. Your problem is doing what the will of God that you know is. And it's God's will for you to suffer for Christ's sake. The Bible says over in Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, for unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ. Not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. First Peter 4, 19. <clears throat> he talks about suffering. And he said, wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. Paul said, uh, yea, and all that will live God in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Well, that's God's will. If you you're suffering according to the will of God. That that will is when you suffer for doing right. You take it without murmuring and complaining and griping about it. And then sixthly, it's God's will for you to be thankful. First Thessalonians 5, 18, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now you get those six things straight about the will of God, the Lord of your life, then then you pray about things that maybe aren't covered in the scriptures. You pray about them and then uh, circumstances can dictate the will of God. Like Paul said, there's a door up and open unto me and effectual, but there are many adversaries. Uh, an open door can be the will of God. But I'm going to tell you something. An open door ain't the will of God if you don't have those other scriptural things squared away first. The devil can open a door for you. If you don't have the, the will of God straighten out those other areas. But anyway, the Lord of your life, the language of your life, the uh, length of your life. And fourth, I'd like to say this, the law of your life. Uh, he said, there, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. There in verse 17. There's a, hmm, we talk about, preachers talk about doing this, doing that, and not doing this not doing that those those things are good there's uh sins that ought to be preached against amen i mean we do things we shouldn't do but that's uh there in verse 17 he's talking about things that you don't do that you ought to do amen the greatest sin in the world that a man goes to hell for is something that he don't do he don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't trust Christ. It's the sin of unbelief. It's something he doesn't do. It's what he goes to hell for. I mean, I'm I'm not for murder. I'm not for rape. I'm not for clubbing baby seals and any any nasty, vile, wretched thing that you can think of. But that ain't why people go to hell. They've got help for not doing something, for not trusting Christ. And save people, I'm going to tell you, we get on our self-righteous high horse about stuff that we don't do. I'm going to tell you, you get knocked off that high horse by stuff that you don't do, that you should be doing. That's the, the sins of commission. Like not surrendering. Not offering yourself as a living sacrifice, but not praying. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said that men ought always to pray and not to faint. Paul said pray without ceasing. Samuel said over there in First Samuel 12, 23, Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. He said it's a sin against God. Or intimate. Well, he said it. That it would be a sin against God to put praying or ceasing to pray. Um, something they don't do. The law of our life. I, I know we're not under the Old Testament law. We're not in that dispensation. We're not in that economy. But there's plenty in, in the New Testament, the New Covenant, in the Pauline epistles, 
for us to do and for us to not do. Plenty of stuff. We, we, we're under the law of Christ. The law of our Lord. The law of our life should be the law of Christ. So what's that? Well, one thing is to love one another. <clears throat> if you don't do that, that's a sin of omission. Something you haven't done. Um, not witness. Not trust in God. Lack of forgiveness. Therefore, my beloved brethren, the <laughs> Ephesians 4.32, Therefore, be ye kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You have a forgiving spirit? That's the law, folks. Law of Christ. I mean, we could go on. These could be sermons in and of themselves. But that's the law of life. Even we're we're uh, we're under liberty in Christ. Stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set you free. But you still have the law of Christ that you're subjected to or supposed to be. Uh, the Lord's supposed to be running your life. We ought to say, if the Lord will, find out what the Lord's will is and do it. Find out what the Lord's will ain't. Don't do that. Amen. All right, that's been kind of a, a rough message, but I want to leave you with this thought. Well, let me say this. If you're listening to this and you've never been saved, like I said, you're going to hell and you're doing it against the will of God. He died for your sins. The Lord Jesus Christ did, so you wouldn't have to pay for them. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And the Bible says if you'll trust him, he'll save you and give you eternal life and take you to heaven when you die. What a what a promise! What a blessing! And it's I, I, it's easy. I mean, it's easy because he did the hard part. If you'll just trust him, he'll save you. And you say, folks, we're uh, like I said, we're under the law of Christ. We're supposed to live our lives pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ, not ourselves and not to the flesh. How you doing? Is the Lord pleased with your language? Is the Lord pleased with your life? Is the Lord pleased with what you're doing with the length of time that you have? Are you applying it to wisdom? Is he the Lord of your life? Are you subjecting yourself to his law? Even under grace, we have laws. Abraham is a, is a type of a believer that's under the, the grace of God. Uh, back in the book of Genesis, but they even had laws that he went by and the Lord commended him for keeping those. We have the law of Christ. We ought to submit ourselves to him. What is your life? I'm going to let you answer that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're thankful for this life that you gave us. Lord. We realize it comes from thee. Thankful, Lord, we didn't come from some stardust or primordial goo or whatever else the pseudoscientists have declared that we might have come from, Lord. We know that you created us and made us for a purpose and for a reason. And we pray that you'd help us, Lord, to glorify thee and magnify thee with the short life that we have left. Uh, we pray that the Lord Jesus Christ might come back, Lord, even today. If not, help us to be faithful to thee until you do come back. I pray your blessings, Lord, on the remainder of the service. We're thankful for each one that's here, each one that may be listening on the computer. Uh, save the lost, uh, strengthen and edify, Lord, those that are saved. Strengthen them in thy word. We pray that you would uh, dismiss us now with your blessings, Lord. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's take a break. Mm -hmm.